Hi there everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology. Today we're continuing on with Unit 2, Multicellular Organisms, and we're going on to Key Area 2, which is Control and Communication. So there are two parts to Control and Communication, and we're going to start off with the nervous system. So, the nervous system is made up of two parts. There's the central nervous system, which we abbreviate to the CNS, which is made up of your brain and your spinal cord. So that the brain and the spinal cord work together to become the central nervous system. The other part of the overall nervous system, though, is down to peripheral nerves. So these are the nerves that go all around your body and they connect to the central nervous system so that all this information can be relayed about the body. We're going to look at how that works in a minute. If you actually had a look at the nervous system in terms of it being extracted from you, this is really what you would see. Especially in the picture on the right, you can clearly see the brain and the spinal cord but all these peripheral nerves are all connected together as well and we're going to look at how that actually works. So to start off with, we are going to be looking at the brain. So the brain is made up of several complex parts that all work together in order to send and receive information around the body. And we're going to look at three major parts uh, for the National 5 content. So if you look at this diagram here, this part at the bottom of the brain is called the medulla. So this is found at the top of the spinal cord and it controls all your unconscious responses, such as heart rate, breathing rate, and peristalsis. So things that you don't actually need to, to consciously think about are controlled by the medulla. The second part is called the cerebrum, and this is the part that is what you normally think of if you think of a brain. It's the large folded area of the brain, and that's responsible for all your conscious thoughts. So things like your memory, your retention, your reasoning, any emotion that you have, Things that you're thinking about are controlled in the cerebrum, this largest area here. Finally, we're going to look at the cerebellum, which in this diagram is this dark area towards the bottom right of the diagram. So be careful because cerebellum does sound a bit like cerebrum. Try not to get them mixed up. But the cerebellum is found at the rear of the brain and it coordinates your balance and coordinated movement. That's what that is important for. So you need to know where all of these three parts are, what they're called, and what they do. Next, we're going to look at how information is relayed around the body. So, sensory receptors are found in all parts of your body, and they detect sensory stimuli, or a stimulus, from the environment to produce an electrical signal that's picked up by sensory neurons. That is then carried to the central nervous system, and a response is going to be made from that. So, in order to try and visualise this, because there's a lot of words being thrown at you, I've got a list of receptors on the left-hand side of the screen and a list of different stimuli on the right-hand side of the screen. What I'd like you to do is to pause this and try and match which stimuli would match with which receptor. So if you pause just now, I will go through this. Okay, so hopefully you would figure out that things like your eye, your eye takes in light, that's how you see. So the receptors in your eye are receptors for light or a light stimulus. Your ear it has receptors in it that react or react to a sound stimulus or a stimuli. And receptors on your tongue and nose take in chemicals. So all these different tastes that you have or smells that you have are all caused by chemicals and they get picked up by receptors on your tongue or in your nose. So the stimulus for these are chemicals. That's what you taste or smell. And in the skin, you have a lot of receptors in different parts of your skin and they're what's responsible for touch stimulus or pain or temperature, all these things that you can touch or feel are picked up by receptors in your skin. So we're going to take a deeper look at neurons here. So basically, information passes along neurons through electrical impulses. And that's how all this information gets passed all around the body, all around the nervous system. There are three forms of neuron to actually look at though. So the first one we've just about touched on, are sensory neurons. So these sensory neurons pick up your senses, they pick up stimuli in the receptors and they carry information from your sensory receptors to the central nervous system. The interneurons, which are between them, carry information between the sensory neurons and onto the motor neurons within the central nervous system. So interneurons are found within your brain and your spinal cord, the central nervous system. And finally, there are motor neurons, and they carry information from the central nervous system to effectors. These effectors may either be muscles or glands, but normally that's what then facilitates the movement. 
some sort of reaction to whatever you have picked up from your sensory receptors. And we'll look at some examples of those later on. The way I try and remember this is that sensory neurons pick up senses, motor neurons, if you think of motor meaning movement, it creates movement, and inter just means between, so it's between the sensory and the motor neurons. In a bit more detail, we look at this reflex arc. So if you have a sensory neuron, if you're picking up something, imagine putting your hand on something hot. You're not going to sit there with your hand burning, thinking this is painful, I should probably do something about it. Your sensory neuron is going to be picking up all of these different uh, basically pain stimuli into your skin receptors. That is going to go from your sensory receptors to your sensory neurons, which are going to carry that electrical impulse across to your interneuron, which will then go to your motor neuron. The motor neuron will be making your hand move away. And obviously this all happens incredibly, incredibly quickly, which we're going to look at. And these are reflexes. So in order to remember the order of these, so sensory neuron to interneuron to motor neuron, I try and think of SIM, S-I-M, for sensory intermotor. So talking a bit more about the burning hand example, we're looking a bit more at reflexes. So reflex reactions are an involuntary response to a harmful stimulus, and it protects you from harm. So again, if you think about your hand burning, you have a reflex reaction. You're not thinking about it. It's involuntary. You have not chosen to move your hand away. Your body is protecting you from harm. Because of that, these reflex responses have to be extremely fast. So as I've said, you're not thinking about these reflexes. They're just something you do unconsciously. So although the information gets relayed to the central nervous system, it goes to the spinal cord part of the central nervous system, not to the brain. And that's to speed up this reaction or this response. So again, if you look at this diagram and you see a figure that's held over a candle, this information from the sensory receptors picks up pain. This goes to the sensory neuron, to the interneuron in the spinal cord, and that goes straight to the motor neurons to move your hand away. Finally, from neurons, we want to look at how this all works. These electrical impulses work all the way through each neuron, but there is a gap between each neuron that that electrical impulse has to cross in order for that message to be passed on. Now, this gap is called a synapse, and it looks like this picture here. So on the bottom left of the screen, you have the end of one neuron, and at the top right, you have the start of a new neuron. And that gap, that synapse, is what stops that electrical impulse from just moving continuously across it. Of course, the electrical impulse, the information has to get across that synapse, and they do that through these little chemicals called neurotransmitters, which you must remember. So neurotransmitters are sent from the end of one synapse to the start of a new synapse so that the electrical impulse and the information can get passed on that synapse until the next, uh, on that next neuron until the next synapse. The second part of control and communication is hormonal control, and we're going to compare that to neural control or neural communication in a moment. So hormones you may have heard of before are chemical messengers, and they are found in the system called the endocrine system. So straight away, you could be asked to compare hormones and neurons, and you should hopefully remember that neurons are electrical messengers, they're electrical impulses, whereas hormones are chemical. This endocrine system is made up of different endocrine glands, and these glands release certain hormones into the bloodstream. Once the hormones are in the bloodstream, they travel to interact with their target organ, so the only organ that they will work with. And there are some examples just here. So hormones are carried to all organs through the bloodstream, but as I've said, they would only affect their target organ. It's something that will hopefully remind you a little bit of how enzymes work in terms of being specific. So target organs, so the organ that's going to uh, be used by this hormone, have cells with complementary receptor proteins. So hopefully remember that term complementary, meaning they can only fit with the specific hormone in this case. So if you have a secreting cell like an endocrine gland going into the uh, hormones going into the blood stream, it will go across some target cells that are waiting for another type of hormone. So they won't match with that. It won't work with that receptor it will find the target cells on the target organs and it will react with those in order to have some sort of response. There are some examples of hormones here and what glands they actually work with. So for example, the uh, estrogen hormone works, it gets secreted by the ovary. The ovary is the gland for this hormone. In that it works with the target organ, which is the uterus, and that is the control in females of puberty and menstruation. 
Similarly, in the other side of it for males, you have testosterone, which is produced by the testes. It affects the male reproductive organs, and that controls puberty in males. The one that we're really going to look at, though, is insulin. So insulin is secreted from the pancreas, that is the gland for that hormone, and it affects the liver in different ways in order to control blood glucose concentration. Before we get into that, we need to come across this word called homeostasis. So homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. Basically, what it's doing is it's keeping your body in balance. Your internal conditions have to be kept at certain levels. So for example, we know our temperature, if it gets too hot, it can be really dangerous for us. If it drops too low, it can also be very dangerous for us. And that has to not be affected by changes in the external environment. So for example, if you're in a very, very warm room, your body still has to be about 37 degrees. If you go outside to the freezing cold, your inside of your body still has to be 37 degrees. Your body has to work in order to keep that homeostasis inside you into your internal environment the same and constant. So we are going to be looking at blood glucose regulation. So that's the sugar that's going through your blood in terms of when you have eaten and what we are needing for your survival. So blood glucose regulation is controlled by two different hormones, insulin, which you've probably heard of before in terms of diabetes, and glucagon. And this diagram here shows you the basics of how this works. If you have glucose free in the bloodstream and it's floating around and there's too much of it, the hormone insulin is released in order to convert the glucose into glycogen, which is a glucose store, and that gets stored in muscle and liver cells. On the other end though, if there is too little glucose going in your bloodstream and you need more of it, then that glucose store of glycogen has to be broken down into glucose. And to do that, the hormone glucagon is secreted to break down the glycogen back into glucose. And this will happen constantly in order to keep homeostasis off your blood glucose. The next slide is going to show you this in greater detail. I'd really recommend copying it down and looking over it a lot because you are very likely to be asked this question and there's quite a lot to it. So if we start off at the middle left of this screen, we're looking at blood concentration of glucose is at a normal level. And if we go up, if there was an increase in blood glucose concentration, we want to see how we could fix that in order to bring the glucose level back to normal levels. So if you've just eaten some food, your blood glucose level, the concentration of glucose will increase. In response to this, the pancreas, the receptors, will pick up this increase in glucose and it will release insulin in response to this. This insulin means that glucose is taken into the muscle and liver cells and it's stored as glycogen, so the, gly the glucose store that we looked at in the previous slide. And this leads to a decrease in your blood glucose concentration, which means your glucose concentration in your blood will get back to a normal level, which is what we want. However, if you've not eaten in a long time, this can be if you've had a long break between meals or sometimes when you've woken up in the morning, your blood glucose level will be fairly low. So this decrease in blood glucose concentration means that the pancreas again picks up this low level of glucose, this decrease in concentration, and it releases the hormone glucagon in response to this. The glucagon goes across to the liver cells and the muscle cells and breaks down that glycogen, that glucose store, to release the stored glucose back into the bloodstream. This leads to an increase in the blood glucose concentration, which will then put it to a normal level again. So you need to know this level, both in terms of an increase in glucose, what happens, and a decrease in glucose, what happens. Remember the roles of glucagon and insulin, and I'll have some questions in our quizzes later on for this as well. Finally, because this is quite hard to remember, there's this little rhyme that you can, you can look at, okay? So, Low blood sugar, glucose is gone. What you need is glucagon. To turn glucose into glycogen, what you need is insulin. Now, it's something that it can get in your head and you need to remember the different uses of these hormones and what these hormones are, particularly because glucose, glucagon, and glycogen sound very, very similar. You need to know what all of these do, what their impact is, what they target, and where they are secreted by. So that's what you need to know for controlling communication. It's quite a long key area, there is a lot to it, but if you go back to nervous control, make sure that you know of the structure of the nervous system, the central nervous system, and the three different types of neuron that you can get. Also, the role of receptors, how neurons pass electrical impulses around the synapse, 
and also if you look at the structure and function of the reflex arc, remember SIM for that. In hormonal controls, you need to be able to compare hormones to neurons in terms of hormones being chemical and neurons being electrical. Also have a look at how they work, at how hormones will only work with their, uh, specific hormones will only work with their target organ. And you need to look at the process of blood glucose regulation and the roles of insulin, glucagon, glycogen, and the pancreas and liver. So thanks so much for listening to these folks. I really appreciate everyone getting in touch and saying it's been helpful. I'm very, very glad it's been helping you out. I'm going to uh, make a quizzes and add this to it so you can practice your knowledge. But please go through these. Keep going through the ones from Unit 1 and Unit 3 as well and just try and use your notes to answer the questions, especially from this section, blood glucose regulation, as there's a lot to it. Thank you very much for listening.